I want to um, welcome again Lisa Kerry, who's our new team leader of the Central Baptist Association. If those who don't know, this is a Baptist church. It doesn't appear very Baptist. I don't know what does, really. But, um, uh, but we're, yes, we're part of the Central Baptist Association. All the, the Baptist Union, of which we're a, a part, um, is divided up into different regions across the country. Uh, we're part of Central because we're Central. Um, and so uh, it's great to welcome Lisa and her husband, Alan, to us. Um, Lisa, not long ago, was minister at Croxley Green um, Baptist. That's near London, wasn't it? And now she's looking and moving moving to Stony Stratford. Oh, it's not. It's changed. Oh, changed. Okay. Master Mortain. Oh, that's, even, oh, that's a lovely area. Yeah, my mentor lived in Master Mortain. So they're going to live in Master Mortain. So there we go. <laughs> Update. See, things are just constantly changing. This is a season of change for everything. Um, so it's great to welcome them. And uh, I just want to pray for Lisa. Lisa, come and join me. And I'm just going to pray for Lisa as uh, she preaches and brings God's word to her. And um, if, you, if you're happy to do it, please reach out your hand as though you're laying hands on Lisa. We're just going to pray for her. Lord, we just want to thank you uh, for Lisa. We thank you for her ministry at uh, Croxley Green. Lord, we just pray for your blessing upon her as, as, uh, as she and Alan move uh, into their new property in Master Portain, the lovely area. Lord, we just pray that everything goes smoothly. We pray for her ministry as she port, supports churches and ministers across this association. Uh, and Lord, we pray for Alan too as he um, uplifts her and kind of works alongside her in a way by supporting her and, and uh, the advice and wisdom he gives to her to share as well. May you just bless them as a couple in this new season of their life, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is absolutely lovely uh, to be here with you this morning. And on this um, very exciting day as you launch uh, this next phase of your building, um, what a wonderful building you have already. And uh, how wonderful to hear how God is using it and what God might be doing in the future. Um, it's particularly important, isn't it, when we've had a momentous week where things have come to an end and new things have started, to remember that God is constant, uh, that he's always faithful, and that he's always so many steps ahead of us, isn't he, in terms of knowing the way forward. Well, we're going to be looking at a uh, story of one of the healings of Jesus this morning in Luke chapter 13. And I've asked Alan to come and, uh, and read it for me. You might need a microphone. Um, that'd be great. Just so that you don't get my voice the whole time. Thank you. Yeah, Luke 13, verse 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over, couldn't straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work. So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall, lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds perched in its branches. Again, he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked through the dough. This is the word of the Lord. I want to start by uh, reading you a poem. Um, and you might have come across this poem yourself. It's called The Warning, and it goes like this. 
When I am an old woman, I shall wear purple, with a red hat which doesn't go and doesn't suit me. And I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals and say we've no money for butter. I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit. <laughs> Sounds awful, doesn't it? Anyway, you can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausages at a go or only bread and pickle for a week. I really don't advise that. That sounds like an explosion waiting to happen. But, and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. But now we must have clothes that keep us dry and pay our rent and not swear in the street and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers. But maybe I ought to practice a little now. So people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I am old and start to wear purple. <laughs> now, I've been aware of this poem for a little while, but it struck me as particularly relevant as I am now getting older. And as I take on a role that some would describe as a Baptist bishop. And of course, my Anglican colleagues do indeed wear purple and red hats and have a range of very snazzy sticks <laughs> that they might run along railings when no one is looking, but I can't verify that. Whether they spit and spend their stipend on brandy, I wouldn't like to say. But putting analogies with bishops aside, this poem is essentially about choosing life and being brave enough to break unspoken rules, rules that have been placed on us by our age or our gender. Now, I don't know what you are like with rules. Some of us warm to situations with rules. I'm certainly one of those people. You know, a set of rules makes me feel very comfortable. I like to know I'm keeping the rules. But some of us are born rebels, like the woman in this poem. I can see there's some here. Now, during COVID, we all had more than our fair share of rules, didn't we, to follow? And those of us in church leadership probably feel like we never want to read a risk assessment or a government document about rules ever again. And yet those rules and those risk assessments kept us safe and eventually allowed us to go back to normal living again, didn't they? Rules can be life-giving or they can be life-sapping. The woman who wrote this famous poem wrote it when she was actually very young. Despite the fact that it has birthed a whole community of women, look at it up online, who like to break the rules and wear purple dresses and red hats, it doesn't quite appreciate the reality of many of the rules that do come into play as you get older. Some of them I am discovering for myself now. But this poem does seem to encapsulate the desire to break out from life sapping rules that diminish and reduce us as it speaks to unspoken rules about our age or our gender, about social norms or even fashion. The story Alan read for us today is on the surface a story about healing, but it is also very much a story about rules. The woman who comes to the synagogue on the day that Jesus is the visiting preacher has been bound and bent double with the heaviness of the rules. She is about as different from the woman in the poem as it is a, impossible to imagine. And Luke, the doctor, describes her as being crippled by a spirit for 18 years. For 18 years, something had gradually cowered and defeated this woman until she was no longer able to look up at the trees, to see the sky, or even look anyone in the eye. I doubt very much if this lady was running her stick along public railings 
I expect she was trying her best to become more and more invisible. We don't know what it was that did this to her, but we can imagine. Who knows what the first blow was that made her a little bit more stooped. Perhaps it was unseen arthritis that started to bend her spine. Or maybe it was the heavy weight of life and loss that bent her over. What we do know is that as her infirmity became more pronounced, she would have become more and more ostracised from her worshipping community. This unexplained disability that deprived her of so much was adding to the problem as the rules of society and synagogue made her a stooped outcast. But then something amazing happens. I wonder how long it had been since she had been noticed. How long since she had even been to the synagogue. And yet on this day, with Jesus preaching in front of the whole congregation, something transformational happens. Jesus sees her. One of the really lovely things, as I've been listening to people's remembrances of the Queen, is hearing the stories on the radio this morning of very ordinary people who met her. People who just worked in charities, people who worked in local government, people who happened to be working in the hospital that she visited. And they all say the same thing, that when they met the Queen, she looked them full in the face, asked them a question that made them feel seen and heard, and smiled at them in a way that made them feel incredibly important. They were seen by the Queen. This lady in the synagogue was seen by the King of Kings. And for anyone here today who has ever felt invisible, they will know how radical this small statement is. Jesus sees her. Not just that he notices that a crippled woman has walked in in the middle of his talk, he sees her. And we know that he really sees her because he calls her forward. And Luke tells us that he put his hand on her, setting her free. This woman, who hasn't been able to straighten up under the weight of all her crippling infirmity for 18 years, stands up straight and looks Jesus in the eye. She looks her king in the eye. And in that healing moment, all the rules that surrounded her disability were broken. Jesus sees, calls, touches and frees her in one law-breaking moment. And on one quiet Sabbath in a provincial synagogue, the kingdom of God breaks loose. But not to everyone. There are some people in that congregation who are definitely the sort who love rules. When confronted with this miraculously freed woman praising God, their response is that she has come on the wrong day for her healing. I'm sure we've all encountered this kind of attitude in life at times. Maybe we can have the next slide. Have you ever encountered this sort of attitude? <laughs> We're moving house. And every time you phone someone about moving house, it feels like the answer is computer says no, can't tell you the answer. It can be totally undermining, can't it, to be met with the kind of attitude that cannot see beyond the rules or the guidelines. To be sat in front of a person who is so hemmed in by those rules that they cannot take a single risk to step beyond those rules and see what is more important. That story of the person in the garage phoning the car factory and just asking if there was wriggle room in the rules. That person could see beyond the rules, couldn't they? 
to bring God's kingdom in, in a small way. And Jesus takes that risk. He knows that it is the Sabbath and that for some people in that synagogue that morning, that is going to be more important than even other people. But he can see beyond the rules into this woman's suffering. And so he takes all the risk and releases her. Can we have the next slide? I don't know if she looked like this after Jesus healed her. But I like to think that something of the spirit of that poem was released in her when Jesus healed her. So Jesus releases her, but he also confronts the double standards of those who can't see beyond the rules, calling out their hypocrisy and humiliating them in front of a joyful congregation. He reminds them that God's priority is his children. And that the rules are there for their care and protection, not to overburden them. Now, as someone who perhaps represents the more formal side of church life for you today, I feel a particular warning in this gospel story. It is true that in wider church life, there are some rules that are useful for us to stick to. Rules around safeguarding and health and safety might make us frustrated at times, but they are there for ours and other people's well-being. They are important. However, what we mustn't lose sight of is the risk-taking, rule-breaking Jesus who sees, calls, touches, and heals those social rules which can be so heavy and yet so unseen. <coughs> were not a barrier to Jesus, and they shouldn't be a barrier to us. As we face so much change, as we face a cost of living crisis, rising fuel bills, and terrible news of wars and violence, it is true to say that many of us feel crippled by the spirit of the age that we live in. For some of us, we face daily crippling anxiety about how we are going to provide for our families, what we are doing to the planet, or any number of other burdens that we carry around. These anxieties are not just crippling, they're also isolating. We have the next slide, please. Perhaps if we were really honest with each other, we would all identify with this stoop lady in the synagogue that day. Perhaps we are, like her, bent double with the cares of everyday life. Perhaps we are, are like her, longing to be really seen. As I was reading this passage over and over, the way that we do when we really want to get to the heart of what Jesus is saying and doing here, I found myself asking the question, what was it that this woman would remember most about this healing encounter with Jesus? Would it be that heart-stopping moment when Jesus called her over in front of the whole gathered congregation? Or perhaps it was the words he gently spoke into her ear as he bent down to meet her level. Or maybe it was the moment he touched her, a woman who had probably not been touched in years. Or was it the moment she straightened up and looked into the face of Jesus? I can't help but think that it was this moment that really healed her. It wasn't just that she was upright and able to move. It was the experience of looking full in the face of the person who knew and loved her the most after years of looking to the ground. For that woman, the kingdom of God had broken into her life in the most personal way, even though nothing around her had physically changed. I am sure that all the things that had gradually worn her down were still present. In fact, we hear some of them, don't we, whining. Those voices who felt that she had been healed on the wrong day. But she was different 
because she had looked into the eyes of Jesus. And that experience had lifted her out of her sorrow and caused her to worship God and welcome in his new kingdom. Now, as a visiting speaker in your place of worship today, I don't know what things are weighing you down. I don't know what specific things might be lowering your eyes from Jesus as you wrestle with anxieties and worries. But I do know that he sees you. That same Jesus who saw the woman in the synagogue that day sees you and every care and concern that you carry. And like the delighted crowd in the synagogue that day, he longs for you to be able to recognize where his kingdom is coming in, even in the most oppressive spirit of our age. I love the way that Jesus, while some people are rejoicing and others feeling totally humiliated by his rebuke, speaks into that range of emotions by asking one of his brilliant questions. What is the kingdom of God like? In the midst of the obvious evidence of his kingdom coming in, Jesus tries to describe it so that no one will miss it. And Jesus, being Jesus, of course, uses analogies that all his hearers would recognize. Perhaps we could have the next picture. The tree that springs from a tiny seed and that is able to provide a home for the birds and the yeast mixed into the daily bread of life. Both these tiny organic things pointing to the way that the kingdom of God spreads organically and beautifully through creation and our world. But I also think that Jesus is really talking to the woman here. She knows physically and spiritually that the kingdom of God has come, but just to make sure, he uses illustrations that she would be very familiar with. The low branches of the mustard seed tree may have just been within her view when she was bent double, perhaps one of the few trees she could see. And the rising bread, something she would have seen and worked with every day of her life. These descriptions were not random. They were loving pictures for a woman who has seen, called, touched and healed by Jesus. So what would Jesus say to us this morning? If he called us over and spoke into our lives, what hidden burdens would he want to be lifting off of our backs so that we could straighten up and look into the eyes of the God who loves us. I wonder if we should just spend a minute in quiet asking Jesus just that question. So I encourage you to perhaps close your eyes. Perhaps hold your hands out so that you can receive something from God this morning. And listen to these questions that you might want to place in front of Jesus. What is it that you, Jesus, see bearing down on me that perhaps I haven't even noticed yet? What burdens do you long to share with me and help me carry? What anxieties are you longing for me to cast onto you? And what are the crippling situations that are causing me pain today that you long to bring healing to? Maybe hold on to the answers that Jesus has given you this morning. Once we have looked Jesus in the eye, something changes in our vision. Like the woman in the synagogue that day, we can suddenly see the world around us much more clearly. 
we can raise our eyes and look for evidence of his kingdom coming in. Perhaps it is small things, like the seeds of a tree leaving little saplings in its wake. Or maybe Jesus can show you where the yeast of his kingdom is working in the daily bread of your life and work, your family and your neighborhood. What pictures of your daily life would Jesus want to use to describe his kingdom coming in to you? And so I want to challenge us all this morning not to wear red and purple, although if you want to, knock yourself out, but to grasp that spirit of freedom that the poem tries to find and express, but which can only be found in the loving gaze of Jesus. To take that spirit of freedom and love and to undermine the unseen rules of our nation, not to be lawbreakers, but to be people who refuse to be bound by the laws of division and hatred, poverty and greed. To be people who really see the unseen amongst us and who reach out and touch the ones who have felt ostracized and lonely. To break the social rules that say God doesn't have anything to say to the complex problems we face in our world. So however old we are today, whether we wear red and purple or whether we love to play by the rules, know that Jesus sees you today and invites you to join his kingdom. If you are bowed down, he calls you to straighten up and look into his face of love for you. And as we do, we will see his kingdom growing. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this morning's service. It's been great to have you with us. I just wanted to very briefly share with you how you can give your heart to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. I became a Christian when I was eight years old at a kid's summer holiday club. And it was an amazing time. And I remember praying a very simple prayer and I remember the feeling in my heart, in my life, that I just had that feeling inside of me. Something changed when Jesus came into my life. And the great thing is that when we do it, when we ask Jesus into our life, he doesn't just add it onto his to-do list. It happens straight away, straight away. And it's just, it's, it's the best decision we could make in life. You can change the trajectory of your life when you ask him in. And when he comes in, he comes in to, to be your friend, to be your Lord, to be your savior, to be your helper in difficult times. And you know, I've been through some incredibly difficult times in my life, but I know that God has helped me every step of the way. Jesus has been with me every step of the way. And when I've had important decisions to make, I've prayed about them. And Jesus has helped me to make the right decision. When I've gone through tough times, he's comforted me and enabled me to get through those difficult times where otherwise I probably would have taken another course of action, but he's helped me in those times. And so when I was eight years old, I remember praying a very simple prayer and, and the prayer involved just these few simple sentences. I asked Jesus to forgive me. I admitted that I'd done something wrong. I repented of my sin. And I made that 180 degree turn to start following him. And so if you want to do that this morning, if you want to take that step, then I want to help you pray that prayer. So if you're ready for that now, let's do it now. So just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I have sinned. I recognize that I've done my life my way. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I repent of my sin. Please come into my life. I choose right here, right now to make that 180 degree turn and start following you and living my life the way you would want me to. Please come into my life to be my Lord and Saviour. 
And if you've prayed that, then that's then fantastic. I'm so pleased for you that you've changed the trajectory of your life. You have made the most important decision you could make in your entire life. But I want you to do two things for me. The first thing is this. I want you to get in contact with me and let me know that you've prayed that prayer. And the reason is because then we can be accountable to one another. We can support one another. So when you send me an email, the email address will come up at the bottom of the screen. I can get back in touch with you and I can send you some, some information to help you uh, on your journey as a new Christian. The second thing I want you to do is to get into a good church. Now I don't know where you live. If you live in Milton Keynes, you're welcome to come to Shenley Christian Fellowship or there are other great churches in this city that you can be a part of. But if you live at other places in the country, then I want to try and help you find the church to be a part of. It's important that we're part of a church which is welcoming, a church that teaches the Bible, a church that believes in great worship, and also a church that will help you on your journey as a Christian. We call it discipleship, but, but it's basically teaching us how to how to live our life as a Christian. And so I want to help you do that if I possibly can. So thank you for being with us this morning. I'm so pleased that you made that step. But if you haven't prayed that prayer and you still need time to think, then I want to encourage you to think it through. And I want to encourage you to pray and ask Jesus and say, can you help me in making this decision? Because he will do that. And, uh, and we, I just want to bless you this morning. So just take care and stay safe.